Chuck, we got another explainer video ready to drop. Ah, uh, yes, and a good one indeed. Uh, well, ready? I don't know if it's good yet. Well, you know what? <laughs> I do, I do indeed. <laughs> you, you th you're thinking this one's going to be good. I, I, I'm telling you right now because we we got we got some really um, some significant help to make this one really good. And I love getting some help. We've got James Green from NASA with us yeah. to do an explainer video on Mars. Woo! Mars, because we are going back to Mars. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Jim, great to have you back. Remind me of your like full title at NASA. Uh, I am the NASA chief scientist. Uh, Excuse me. Well, wow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I was the head of planetary. For That's what I thought. Years. That's yeah, what I remembered. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I uh, uh, got promoted. Uh -huh. know, so that's the nice. way it goes. <laughs> so, Jim, you got that new fancy title. Okay. But also, you got into the podcast business. Okay. I did. What's, the name, what's the name of your podcast? It's called Gravity Assist. This is Good actually name. My, yeah, Good yeah. Name. It, it, it's the fourth season, mm -hmm. and uh, today uh, we've been taping uh, all about the search for life beyond Earth. It's a great Excellent. season. Excellent. Excellent. So we just launched the Mars Perseverance rover. Why didn't we launch last year or? Oh, well, you know, indeed, every 26 months, the orbits of Earth and Mars line up to be on the same side of the sun that we actually can get to Mars as quickly as possible. So it's a window. It's a window. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's much like American football where you throw the football down the field and the receiver runs and grabs it. And that's all, that's what we're going to do. It's a ballistic trajectory from Earth to Mars. So, so you're launching this to arrive where Mars will be when it gets there. On the 18th of February, mark my word. Wow. <laughs> my, my boy's got some confidence in Newtonian physics right well, there. Well, I, I was gonna say he better uh, seeing as how uh, I saw the budget. <laughs> so, 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 so Kepler so, helped us out, you know. <laughs> so, so Jim, what's, uh, what's different about this rover compared to the others? Uh, this one is, absolutely fantastic it's a huge step forward because not only does it sort of look like curiosity it's got all new instruments and one of them on the arm is a rock core so we are going to mars and creating cores like this with a so, so it's not saw. just it's not just the surface material right you're going in we're going in we're going to core rock and and rock the rock record is so important, as we know here on Earth. It's the history of the geology of the Earth. Same thing on Mars. So we're going to look for aspects of climate change and whether early Mars may have had life. So where are you targeting on Mars for this? We're going to a crater called Jezero Crater. But it's really, it's really right at the ancient shoreline of Mars. And so there's a river, an ancient river, bringing material from large regions on Mars into this crater and depositing a delta and then flowing over the crater wall into the ancient ocean. Wait, Jim, Jim. Wow. There's no water on Mars now, so what are Not you talking about? Not at the about? moment, okay. but in the past. <laughs> in the past. <laughs> in the past. Now, it turns out Mars does have an enormous amount of water. It's just locked underneath the surface and in the, in the northern polar cap. But what you're describing as this target is yeah. a place where formerly water was just there. Right, four billion years ago. And you're, you're going for beachfront property. Yeah, and you know why? It's really, you know, we think about life coming out of our ocean onto land, learning how to evolve and live on the land. And so the, the you know, that ancient shoreline is where a lot of our missions go. Gotcha. Mm. So now where is the atmospheric generator buried deep inside of Mars? <laughs> Where would that be? <laughs> Chuck wants to move there. Chuck wants to buy property okay. on that beachfront. Listen, Chuck right. wants a condo. Hey, yeah. listen, you know what they say, buy on the fringe and wait. Okay. You, you may have to ask Arnold about where he'd find it there. But... Arnold. <laughs> exactly. Arnold. Uh, 
Send you back to Mars. Get your ass to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so uh, if this is styled like uh, Curiosity was, yes. does that mean it will arrive at Mars the same way Curiosity yeah. did? And what was that? There was six minutes of terror. Uh, will it survive the the entry? Right. Is, is, are we going to watch? Are we going to experience that again with this? We are. We're going to use the same process. If it worked once, and you know, it's not always a guarantee it's going to work exactly the same way. Right. We're going to do that again. And the reason why is this rover is even more massive than Curiosity is. This one is a little more than one metric ton. Wow. So, so it's, you're talking can about. I, can it's, I it's, ask you both a question? Wait, uh, it's the size of a car. You're dropping that, a car. That's right. huge. It okay. Is. So it can is. I ask you guys a question when you talk about, the, uh, you know, dropping this rover down into Mars, okay? Yeah. So when something enters Earth's atmosphere, it's basically the atmosphere that is the problem because it's a lot of friction, creates all this heat. But Mars doesn't have a lot of atmosphere. Right. So what are the big worries and what's the big, like, uh, drawback to putting something on the surface of Mars? Wait, wait, Chuck, I have to correct you just okay. briefly. You're thinking of the atmosphere as a problem because I it am. creates heat. It's not. However, go ahead. The atmosphere allows you to slow down. Oh, so atmosphere with, is brakes? Out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Okay, okay, Jim, take it from there. All right. So when we hit the top of the atmosphere, we're going thirteen thousand miles per hour, and when we land, six and a half minutes later, we've got to be going inches per second. Wow. And so we have a lot of momentum to take out and it starts with the heat shield. Okay. And one way to do that is uh, uh, Mars's atmosphere is actually much thinner than ours. Right. And so we need to travel in the atmosphere as much as we can. So we change the center of gravity of the capsule. Instead of having it come down straight, we blow some mass, cock it this way and fly as ah. parallel to the surface of Mars as we can. Wow. So with, without even without even having atmosphere, you're almost creating like a glider. Well, it, the friction uh, indeed uh, slows it down from that 13,000 miles per hour to then about 250 or so miles per hour. Then we change the mass distribution, right it, pop a chute. And that chute then allows us to get it down below 100 miles an hour or so before we drop the rover to the surface. Okay, now I'm just going to say something. Mm -hmm. I've never been in a, uh, I've never been in a collision at 100 miles an hour before, uh, because I probably wouldn't be here. So <laughs> Is that correct. So. <laughs> I mean, you you say that like a hundred miles an hour is a fender bender. How do you? What happens? What happens at a hundred miles an hour when you hit the ground? Well, we have a platform that sits on top of the rover, and it has retro rockets. They then take off and slow the vehicle down. Such from a hundred miles an hour. From a yeah. hundred miles an hour. Yeah, from a mm hundred -hmm. miles an hour slows it down and actually stops it at about 25 meters from the surface. Wait, Chuck, just to be clear, they could have done that upon contact with the atmosphere, but it would have needed fuel to slow right. them down from 13,000 miles an hour. So why not use the atmosphere to take most of that out gotcha. and save the little bit of fuel you're carrying for just that last little leg? Right. Did I get that right? Yeah, okay. that's right. And so what will happen then this, uh, this uh, platform that sits on top of the rover is called the sky crane. And the reason why is we're gonna crane it down to the surface. So as we start the craning, then the, then the fact that we've sort of folded up the rover inside and tucked it into the capsule allows it for the wheels to come out and lock and everything get ready for then the rover to sit down on the surface at inches per second. So you've got a joist that's unrolling for this thing to descend. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. That's, that's no, crazy. it's not. Okay. It, makes, <laughs> it makes fantastic sense when you think about but it. But there's a lot of things. It's like a Rube Goldberg thing. First, you, no, do, do, you no. do the hokey pokey, you move the center of mass, you put out the drogue chute, you have the retro rockets, you pop the tires. You do, And I'm thinking, aren't those many points a of lot failure? Of steps. Oh, yeah. That's right. And we have to test each and every one of them. And then we try to figure out how to test them in between. 
But because Curiosity landed using that same approach, we have great confidence that we can re repeat that, okay? So we'll use the same procedures. What are these and images so, I've seen of something that looks like it, it's got like uh, drone propellers or something? What is that? Ah, so in addition to the rover, you know, that, that looks like Curiosity, you know, uh -huh. this huge rover, this little model of it, underneath the belly pan sits what we call a technology demonstration mission. And it turns out to be a helicopter. And it's a, uh, a counter-rotating uh, set of, uh, 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 of wings, you know, that then uh, rotor rotate. Blades. Rotor yeah, blades. blades that rotate more than 3,000 RPM and then uh, takes off. Now, how we do that is we first drop it, then we get out of the way, and then we send the command, take off. That's super cool. And then, oh, is, is it going anywhere? Is it going to take well, pictures? Is it? Yeah, because it's a test. You know, we've never flown anything in, in an atmosphere besides the Earth. So this is the first flight of an object. And, and you and need those high atmosphere. RPMs because of the thin atmosphere. Right, that's right. So you, you and it's only four pounds. So it's only lifting a little box, about four pounds. And so it's going to go through several tests. So the first test is pick up, go a couple meters up, and then come down. That, and that'll be successful. Then we'll charge up the batteries, and the next day we'll do another test. That test will be go up, translate, and then sit down. Translate is code for move sideways. Move sideways. Move sideways. Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. Sorry. <laughs> right. Uh, I thought it was just going to, like, start to learn Martian, you know. <laughs> Translated to Martian. Translate. Hello. <laughs> Wait, we come in peace. <laughs> so, so, Jim, this mission is, um, you, you, you speak of it as though you're just having a conversation with the rover, but there's the time delay of your right. signal. It's right. like, what, 20 minutes, 10, 20 minutes or something? Well, uh, for Mars, its orbit, based on where Earth is, it can be anywhere from four minutes to 22 minutes. Okay, it, so you can't just say, watch out for the cliff. Right. And, and it's too right. late. That's right. And so what's happening now is uh, we will be about uh, six or seven minutes away uh, light travel time to, uh, to Mars. And so everything's got to be done automatically. Okay. The whole so entire landing sequence is done automatically. All right, so so James, your your professional background is it from geology or from astronomy? I'm a magnetospheric physicist. Okay, oh, neither. Right. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh. So so I never met a magnetic field I didn't like. Wow. Right okay. So um, so tell me what experiments are on this mission, and then we got to sort of wrap it up after All that. Right. So what in ranking in your favorite order ooh, of what ooh, this thing is going to do? Ooh, ooh. All right, so the core, that's important. Mm -hmm. and there's two instruments that help the core make the decision. Once wait, wait, by the way, I'm not a geologist. I keep thinking what the rock is on the surface is probably the same a few inches in, but you're telling me, no, the rock could be completely different on the inside. That's well, what you're telling me. Well, you know, uh, Curiosity told us that. So when, you know, the, the red Mars is there, and when we took uh, and dug just below the surface, we saw gray Mars. Oh, because it's not oxidized. Planet. It's not oxidized. Oh, it's okay. a different planet. Okay. Oh, because Mars is red era. from the iron oxides. Okay, got it. Right. So indeed, finding the right spot to core is important. And so the context instruments are Sherlock and Pixel. Those are on the arm. And they're going to do imaging, and they're going to help the, us decide here's where we're going to go. In addition to that, we have another instrument called RIMFAX. It's from Norway, and it sits underneath the belly pan next to where the copter would be after we drop it. And it is a ground penetrating radar. It gives us stratigraphy. It gives us an idea, hey, this might be a good place to drill. That's important. And then we have, you know, right on the mast, uh, right here at the top, a fabulous instrument uh, uh, called SuperCam, and it is designed to send out a laser, evaporate the rock, get a spectrum, and help us understand the composition of the rocks in front of us, and then guide us to where we want to go. That's you know, Chuck, 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 if, if, if Martians are there on the surface and they see this with laser beams coming out of it, right. they're going to they're gonna think we're declaring war. Exactly. Yeah. We no longer come in peace. You know? <laughs> we, no longer, we no longer come in peace. We come here know? to vaporize you. Exactly. Okay. Oh, you, know? you know, they may think we're just heating up the place so they can, you know, barbecue out, but that might be a different story. Another instrument 
is mass cam. All right. And this one, you know, has, um, uh, has a, a, a fabulous set of cameras that sit below super cam. And, and they are at about the height of my eyes, which uh, since I'm 6'4", at about six feet. So the stereo imaging that we get is going to be just like a human walking around on the surface. Sweet. So and then we have an instrument called Moxie. This is the one that brings in the atmosphere. We zap it. And so you take CO2, which is a predominant uh, atmospheric composition, pop off an oxygen, giving you then carbon monoxide and oxygen. You vent the carbon monoxide, and then you understand how much oxygen you can get from the process. And we do that during the morning, afternoon, and evening, and throughout the year. That gives us an efficiency factor, and that's you know that's like Mark Watney's oxygenator. This is so. This is like if you if you go there, this you'll have prior knowledge of how effectively you can right. pull oxygen out of the CO two molecule. Wow. That's right, and okay. and that's important to supplement whatever we take there. And in fact, it may be the main way we acquire uh, oxygen to use in a variety of purposes. Uh, breathing, of course, is one of them. Adding hydrogen to it gives us water. So there's, you know, oxygen's important, got to have it. There's another instrument that is pretty special to me, all right? And, and hardly anyone knows about it. But, you know, as head of planetary, and we were putting this together, I said we absolutely have to have a Cup microphone. Holders. Cup holders. Sorry. Cup holders. I'm sorry. I, I took a guess. Say it again, Jim. I, I stepped cup on holders. You. I, I went with cup holders, but I'm sorry. Say it again. What, what is it? Okay. So the new instrument that's on it that I, I really like is a microphone. This allows us to hear the sounds of Mars. Sweet. Yeah. Now, I, I don't expect that at night while, while uh, Perseverance is sitting there grunging away with stuff that we hear the crickets, but we're going to hear all kinds of sounds as the rover moves. It, you know, we can use it from an engineering perspective, because if you hear metal against metal, we're going to stop it right away and figure out what's happening. And so um, not only is it going to be fantastic to listen to the winds and the sound of Mars, will actually hear the sounds of the rover moving during the day and even at night. Well, but the coolest Chuck, thing in the world would be is if you heard this. Are they gone yet? Yeah, right, right, right. Or, <laughs> or, or, quick, duck, the camera's turning this way. <laughs> Get out of the way. <laughs> I would dearly like that. Let's see if we can find that in the data. The weird thing is not that you would hear them speaking, but that they'd be speaking English. That would be the total weird thing. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> James, we got to call it quits there. Listen, uh, good luck to you and the Thank mission. You. And all you we and it, what's not apparent here in this interview, but thousands of people work on these yes. on these on these craft. They do. All right, excellent, James. Uh, we'll get back to you when when it arrives at Mars safely. Uh, we'll get you back on and just get an update on how this is turning out. My pleasure. Let's do. Chuck, that. always good to see you, man. Always a pleasure to be here. All right, this has been a special edition Star Talk Explainer, getting the latest on our missions to Mars. As always, keep looking up especially if you're looking at Mars. <laughs>